FizzBuzz. It is an up and coming interview question, or should I say an interview challenge that, you know, is actually presented to interviewees at programming jobs. It is getting increasingly popular and has garnered a lot of attention and criticism. So yeah, today, let's take a look from a non-programmer's perspective at FizzBuzz. So yeah, I'm assuming zero background here. We're going to start by understanding the problem and then I'll show you a solution to it. So more on this after the break. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So what is FizzBuzz and why is it such a popular thing these days? FizzBuzz is actually a very simple game in which basically you have to list the numbers from 1 to 100. Every time you encounter a number that is divisible by 3, you say fizz. Every time you encounter a number that is divisible by 5, you say buzz. Every time you encounter a number that is divisible by both 3 and 5, you say fizz buzz. In all other cases, you just say the actual number itself. So that is the problem statement. As a programmer, we're supposed to actually write some code that does this. So yeah, basically, you know, let's try and solve this problem. For the programmers out there, the solution should be obvious to you. Just use a loop. Have several if statements that output different things depending on you know where the iterator is at the moment. And well, that gives you the answer. For the non-programmers, I'll show you what that looks like and I'll explain each line to you. So what you're seeing here is code in a language called JavaScript. Now JavaScript is a programming language that is used very often in browser. So a lot of the interactive things you see in browser, for example, you know, in sites like Facebook, these are actually powered at least partly by JavaScript. So yeah, in fact, what you're seeing on screen is the full solution to the FizzBuzz problem, but we're not going to look at all of this at once. Instead, we're going to build this from the ground up. We're going to start with what is known as a for loop. The concept behind a for loop is essentially you have a chunk of code and you want to run it a certain number of times. The for loop syntax is broken up into three parts, which we can read from left to right like this. So this first part says we create a variable called i, and we want its starting value to be 1. As long as i is less than or equal to 100, then we run the code that is in the braces. At the end of each iteration, that is, you know, after you're done actually executing the code between the braces, you want to do this action at the end. In this case, i++ means increment the value of i. In other words, to make this clearer, we take the value of i, add 1 to it, and then set that to be the value of i. So you can imagine with each iteration of the loop, the value of i increases. This of course saves us the trouble of having to rewrite the logic again and again, because of course we need to process you know, input digits from 1 to 100, and we don't want to have to write our code 100 times. That is why we use the loop to simplify this. And just to show you that this works, we're going to write a bit of code that looks like this. This is the exact same for loop as you've seen just now, but I've now added a new line, which simply displays the value of i. I can now run this code using the open source node.js utility, and this is the result. As you would expect, the for loop makes the console.log statement run 99 times. Each time it runs, it displays the value of i which, as you can see, starts at 1 and increases each time. As evidenced from the last line, the loop terminates when the value of i exceeds 100, in accordance with our terminating condition. So now that we have a loop that runs from 1 to 100, what we need to do now is to do the actual processing. Thankfully, since we're using the variable i to be our counter for the loop, we can also use it for the actual calculation itself which is why we can now go into the body of the loop and basically write several lines of code with respect to the variable i. We're going to start off by writing an if statement. Now, an if statement works something like this. You start off by saying if, and then you provide a condition. If this condition evaluates the true, then we'll run the code inside the braces. If it does not, then we will not run the code. So for example, if we were to say something like if, i equals a 0, and then we have the braces there. What this means is, when we actually encounter this chunk of code, the value of i is checked. 
If it indeed equals to zero, then the code inside is right. Otherwise, it won't be right. So let's try to use the if statement to implement the fifth part. We say if i modulo 3 equals to zero, then I'll put this. Now, the question is, what is this modulo? This operator is an interesting operator. Now, you don't actually have to use this to solve, you know, this bus, but I use it for the sake of simplicity, and it's not really very hard to understand. Now, if we use the calculator and perform a division, for example, 3 divided by 2, you'll get a decimal value, like 1.5. But instead of thinking of a division this way, we can also think of it, you know, in terms of the way we learned in primary school, which is a quotient and a remainder. So if we were to take 3 divided by 2, we could also express it as a quotient of 1 and a remainder of 1. This is essentially what modulo is trying to do. Modulo basically says you take these two variables and you divide them. But instead of giving us back the answer, you know, the quotient of the division, give us back the remainder. And that is basically the whole idea behind this particular if statement. Take i and divide it by 3. If there is a remainder, it means that this number is not actually divisible by 3. Because, well, there is some remainder. It's not a multiple of 3. So we say if i modulo 3 equals to 0, in other words, if i is divisible by 3, then print this. Alright, so now let's try to check to see if the number is divisible by 5. Obviously, the same code applies. We can basically copy what we had before, but we change the divisor from 3 to 5. Of course, we also need to change the output value from this to bus. So now we're checking for two things, which is great. However, things get a little bit more complicated when we realize we have to account for the this bus state. Essentially, the this bus state says that the number has to be divisible by both 3 and 5. So what we need to do now is we need to add basically an if statement that checks two things instead of one. It's not very complicated, it looks almost exactly like what we had before, but now we have two conditions and a double ampersand operator in the center. This of course just means and. For this whole statement to evaluate the true, both these two sub-statements need to evaluate the true, and that is essentially the rule in which the double ampersand operator enforces. So that's all well and good. We can now check to see if a value is divisible by both 3 and 5. However, this could still create a small problem. Imagine now that the value of i is 15. So, well, let's trace it from top to bottom. The first if statement evaluates the true, since of course, 15 is divisible by 3. So we output this. Then we go down to the next statement and basically realize that 15 is also divisible by 5. So we output but. The last statement of course checks both these things and we realize that both of them are true. And so now we output this bus. So we end up with an output of this bus, this bus for this particular entry. And well, that's too much. What we need is a way to have one statement execute and the moment that executes, nothing else does. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rearrange these statements slightly and then add the else operator and let's see if things make sense to you. I'm going to move this last line to the top so that we basically do the check for both first at the very beginning. Then I'm going to add else operators to the first two if statements we've created. So here's the deal. What we have here now says this. If we have a value that is divisible by both 3 and 5, then we print this bus. Else, in other words, if that previous statement wasn't true, then we check to see if it's divisible by 3 and only 3. If that's not true either, then we check to see if it's divisible by 5. And if it is, then we output bus. So what this means is, if we encounter i equals to 15, what's going to happen is, the first statement is going to evaluate the true, and we're going to get the output of this bus. The next two if statements aren't even going to be evaluated, seeing as that the first statement is true. So we basically skip past everything else. That is the concept of the else keyword. And that is actually how we work around the problem I mentioned earlier. So in fact, we're basically almost all done. Except we currently only print, you know, this bus or this bus. Of course, there are cases where the value is neither divisible by 3 nor 5. 
And in those cases, we want to print the actual value. So we add one more statement at the very end that says else prints i. Of course, now that you understand the concept of else, you'll see why this makes sense. Basically, if none of the above is true, then we print out the value itself. So the else at the end basically doesn't really check any condition. It's just, you know, a fallback state if none of the previous statements evaluated to true. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the full Fizzbuzz code. Yes, we've just actually written Fizzbuzz together. I've just explained this to you in maybe about 10 minutes. So I'm going to take this very simple piece of code and I'm going to run it. And as you can see, these are the results. 1 and 2 is printed verbatim, 3 is printed as fizz instead, 4 is verbatim, 5 is buzz, and so on and so forth. Notice of course that 15 comes out as fizz buzz. And there you have it, that's fizz buzz in a nutshell. As I mentioned, this video is more for, you know, the non-programmers among us. So well, now you understand basically what this entire thing is about, and you've seen how the solution is actually written. Hopefully this gives you a better understanding when, you know, people actually talk about Fizzbuzz. Now you know what is the thought process and what the code to actually implementing it looks like. So yeah, there you have it. Of course, there is still the question of, you know, why do people actually ask for this in interviews? I mean, if someone knows programming, then this should be a piece of cake. I mean, you can write this in five minutes. And for someone who doesn't know programming, well, they won't be able to do anything about this at all. Well, apparently from what I've read, that is the purpose. To weed out the non-programmers who are actually, you know, trying to apply for a programming job. However counterintuitive that sounds. There is of course a lot more to this particular issue, but hey, that is not a computing issue, which is why I'm not going to talk about it. But, well, the whole idea here is to actually give you some insight into both the problem and the solution of Fizzbuzz. And hopefully today, I've achieved just that. That is all there is for this particular Random Wednesday episode. Hopefully you found it insightful. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.